Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's um, Rosé workshop. My name's Emma, and um, I'm going to be hosting this evening's workshop in um, partnership with my um, colleague, Catherine, who is also on screen. Catherine's going to be doing all of the tech, and I'm going to be doing most of the chatting, but hopefully there'll be a bit of interaction between us and also with you guys as well, because... Um, it is your Thursday night, so it's very informal, and we're um, we're really looking forward to to drinking lots of rosé and um, to having a nice natter about it. So please, please do use the chat function and um, do get involved and tell us where you are, what you're drinking, um, are you drinking all four of them, or have you chosen one? Um, I have all four, which after um, bath time with the three year old actually. I've started on the rosé sparkling already. So um, yeah, hope you're all having a nice Thursday so far and hopefully it's going to get better as well. So Catherine's just doing a few of the bits behind the scenes. So um, while she's doing that, I'm just gonna give you kind of a few facts and figures about rosé and also talk about the different ways in which you can make rosé. So I hope you've all got a glass of wine in front of you. Please do sip as I talk very very dull listening to somebody talking if you don't have anything to drink um so cheers everybody um so let's start talking about rosé so rosé quite often it's overlooked it's kind of deemed not to be a particularly serious wine and um frequently it's seen as being very sweet very fruit driven kind of alco pop kind of um the, the starter wine for people who are just starting out in the world of wine and aren't quite sure which way to go. Um, however, rosé is really making a comeback now and um, dry quality rosés are becoming increasingly fashionable, which I think is kind of spearheaded by the Provence style rosés, the kind of really, really pale rosés, which um, the Chateau Vignolot is a classic example of that. But hopefully, as we'll show tonight, there's lots and lots of different kinds of rosé, and they all very much have their place in the world. A world of rosé and um, just world generally. Rosé is for all year, not just for summer. Um, so a few facts and figures about rosé. Uh, approximately 10% of, of all the wine produced worldwide is rosé. Um, France, it will not surprise you to hear, is the leading rosé producing country. It accounts for nearly 30% of rosé wine production worldwide. And worldwide, Provence is the number one rosé producing region. 80% um, of the world's rosé is produced by four countries. So France produces 7.6 million hectolitres, Spain 5.5 million hectolitres, and the USA has 3.5 million hectolitres. And Italy is um, 2.5 million hectolitres. So he's saying the video is gone. I'm hoping that's not the case. I don't think it is. It's still, it's still there, Simon. It might be um, your your device. But um, if anyone else is having video issues or can't see anything, let us know. Oh, it's mm -hmm. back now. I think we're good. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, no, we're all just going to have to keep drinking and listen to me speaking rather than the video. Um, so rosé um, represents 11% of the UK market, and that's the number that's kind of stabilised. It went up massively at the beginning of lockdown. I think people were just like drink pink, um, but it's now stabilised. So it's sat at, um, sat at 11% and has been for a little while. So ways of making rosé. I'm just going to skip across this a little bit because I'm sure you all know how rosé is made, but as I refer to each wine, I will talk about the particular way in which that wine has been made, and in a way, the kind of the effect that that has had on the flavours and the style of rosé that you've got as well. So rosé can be made in one of four ways, depending on where in the world you're making it. So there's blending, so mixing red wine and white wine together to create rosé. It's permitted in Australia, US and South Africa, um, imports of blended rosé are permitted by the EU. It's not permitted in the, now this is a little bit of a grey area, but as far as I can find out, it's not permitted in the EU for quality wine. Um, I believe that if you're making what I call jug wine, or kind of your, your most basic level of um, table wine, 
then pretty much the gloves are off and you can do more or less what you like. But if you're looking at quality wine, the AC system, then you cannot just put your red wine and your white wine together to make a pink. Um, apparently in early 2009, the EU um, did the European Commission proposed a rule that would allow rosé to be made by blending the two together. Um, but the French wine producers protested. You've got to love the French wine producers. They're very, they know what they want and they will go for it. Um, and as a result, the European the European Agricultural Commissioner withdrew the application. So um, yeah, it's no longer the case. Um, within the EU, you can blend red and white if you're making pink champagne or sparkling wine, which is our first one, which um, I'm gonna hide the ullage level and just get this one here. <laughs> <laughs> They've had rather a large glass of it. Um, so if you're making pink champagne or pink sparkling wine, you can blend the two unless you're just making table wine. Then there's the maceration method or direct pressing. So this is the preferred technique for making most commercial rosés. Um, you have your red grape varieties, you crush them, so you break the skins and you let the juice run. And then the juice and skins are kept in contact for um, a period long enough to extract the desired amount of color and the desired amount of anthocyanins from the, from the skins. So the colored juice is then run off. The grapes are quickly pressed, so they're squashed, all the juice comes out. It's run off from the skins, skins are separated, juice is fermented as you would a white wine. Um, Grenache is probably one of the most commonly used uh, red grape varieties for making rosé. And that normally needs about 24 hours of maceration, so skin contact with the juice. Um, but grape varieties with thicker skins and a lot more color will need a lot less time. So something like Morvedra, which is really quite, um, it's much deeper colored, much more tannic, that would probably only need a few hours in order to get you the desired color. Um, so we talked about maceration and then direct pressing. Direct pressing is where you either put whole bunches or grapes directly, they go straight from being picked directly to the press. So picked to not just crushed, but pressed fully. So you're getting all the juice out and then you're running the juice off and you're, um, you're fermenting like you would a white wine. So that's had no skin contact and juice and it gives you the palest rosés of all. Um, so Van Gris and the blush wines like the Chateau Vignolot, are, um, which are the styles most commonly in fashion, currently in fashion in France and the UK, they're normally made by direct pressing. Um, so if you look at it and you see that it's looking really, really pale or kind of onion skin, as they call it, so just even sometimes just the tiniest hint of pink, then you're thinking, oh, yes, you can tell your two friends, oh, well, you know, probably direct pressing on that particular rosé. Um, and then there's the Sanye method or bleeding method, which is a byproduct of red wine making. So early on in the process of making red wine, some of the, you know, the juice and the skins are all fermenting together. And um, some of the very still quite pale juice will be run off or bled off the tank. Um, the juice is then put into another vessel and there it um, continues to ferment without its skin, just in the same way as a white wine would. So. This means that you're left with a higher ratio of skin contact with the remaining juice, which means that your remaining red wine becomes more red and more deeply colored and um, kind of richer and bolder. And your rosé, you've still got kind of that, it's probably more of a red wine flavor because you're, you're producing your grapes, you're, the grapes in the vineyard are being made in order to produce a red wine rather than being kind of um, grown and ripened for something quite fresh and quite fruity. Um, so your, your red wine will be, your rosé will be a bit more red winey, if that makes sense. It's probably terrible grammar. But, but it'll um, have a bit more of, you know, the, the structure and a bit more that, grip to it. Than... Thank you. That's better than red winey. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so, has anybody, tell us if you've got the sparkling um, at all. I hope some of you have, because I absolutely love the Samuel Rosé sparkling. It's um, it's one of those wines which, at the price, it just offers so much. It's got that real kind of um, strawberry and kind of slightly floral 
um, note to it. And um, I mean, just even having it, oh, the Joneses do, fabulous. I'm glad to hear it. Um, just having it with a bowl of strawberries is great, but um, I do apologize because for those of you who haven't had dinner yet, we do, Catherine and I do talk a lot about food. Um, it's one of our main conversations at work as well. So um, yeah, this this Samuel Brut would be absolutely perfect with a plate of um, fajita smoked salmon um, or just have it on the patio. <laughs> just with um, a nice evening light like tonight, just a glass of Samuel Rosé, absolutely perfect, or with a bowl of strawberries. It's um, it's one of those real, I know the Gratian, the Gratian and Maya website say it's great for weddings. It's a very cheerful, sparkling wine. It's a real crowd pleaser, isn't it? It's one that I think people perhaps would think oh a pink sparkling that's gonna they might have a preconceived idea of what they might be getting in their glass but actually when you have it it's very approachable but also very classy and with the price it's very surprising how affordable it is I know because quite often with the with sparkling roses and spark, rose champagnes they tend to be there's a kind of almost like a pink premium on them they do tend to be that much more expensive than the the standard white um, Karen, I don't think it will go with stew necessarily in Scotland, um, but um, it, yeah, this is actually still extreme. I think it's really affordable. Um, that's I know it's all subjective, but I think um, it's one of those wines where I don't feel really guilty if I open it on a Friday and just go, yay, I made it to the weekend. I'm having a glass of this to celebrate. Um, so just a kind of quick bit of information about it. This is based on the 2020 vintage, is the, the base wines for this wine. Um, it's 70%, according to my figures, it's 70% Cabernet Franc. Um, for Samuel Rosé, the minimum, the mandatory minimum is 60%, so they've gone a little bit up on that. And then they've got Chenin and a little bit of Grolio added to it as well. And um, it's had a short maceration. So the red grapes have been made into quite a pale red wine, still red wines. The Shannon, obviously, into a still um, white wine. And then they have been blended together. Um, so fermentation of base wines, then the wines are blended together and they go through the second fermentation in bottle in exactly the same way that... Um, that you would a champagne. So second fermentation completely in bottle, disgorged, and then onto the market. So I think it's um I think it's excellent value for many. And I hope those of you who are drinking it are enjoying it. Hmm. Has anybody got any comments that they'd like to make? Well, they are enjoying <laughs> it. Yes. <laughs> and I decided against opening it uh, this evening, but it is one that we, I was, me and Emma were chatting in the office today about which wines um, to use. Obviously, Emma would have all four. And I was making a choice on which one I wanted to, to use for this evening. And I, the one I went with is one that I don't drink as often, but because perhaps I drink the others too often. <laughs> not, <laughs> more not possible. As my rose <laughs> drinking. <laughs> mm. That's lovely. Okay, so for those of you who are ready, we can move on to wine number two. Which Emma, did I... you want to talk a little bit about where it's it's from to start? Of before course, we do? sorry. Yeah. I so jumped about with the is slides. From, this is from Gatian and Maya. Um, they are based in Sumur. Have you got, I think I've, um, yeah, Catherine will bring you up the map. So um, we are in the Loire Valley in France, and you can see I put a little heart on um, where in Seigneur it comes from. And for those of you who haven't actually visited Seigneur or visited Gratian and Maya, it's definitely well worth a visit. It's um, a little bit of a trek by car, but it's, it's worth doing because the wines are fantastic. So you can make an entire week there. And um, I was telling Catherine earlier, they do actually, they've got, it's coming up again at the um, soon for this year. They do um, a thing called Jazz Bool, which is jazz and bubbles on their terrace, which you can see, which is where the little um, domed hats are. And um, we went 
a few years ago, we went with the society and it was just the best night out ever. Um, lots and lots of some your rosé on tap um, and a really, really nice evening. So if ever you're thinking, oh, I fancy a little break and I'm not sure where to go, do definitely consider going to some your and go to Gratiana and Maya because it's, it's definitely worth a visit. You'll get a warm welcome. So um, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Otherwise, I'd have gone on completely. I'd forgotten to talk about Gratia. Gratian is one of our longest standing um, suppliers. We've been with them for, gosh, I think it's over a, over a hundred years, isn't it? Um, they're, so they've, um, it's a long, long relationship that we've had with them. And they do obviously the Seigneur, they do the Society Celebration Cremant, but they also do the Society Champagnes as well. Um, under the same house, obviously not from the Loire for those, but their um, Samuel Rosé and their Samuel Spa things are excellent value for many. So um, good wines. Now can I talk about the Berlin <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I threw you <laughs> off, I put the slides in the odd order. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So on to wine number two then. Um, we're what I call pale and interesting. So um, you've, this one is the Van Gris style, so the Chateau Vignolot, um, which is Côté d'Aix-en-Provence. Um, this is made by direct pressing. So back to what I was talking about, where you um, take the grapes, you pick the grapes, normally quite often hand-picked, take them straight into the winery, straight into press. And um, the juice is then immediately removed from the skin. So you're getting quite a pale style of rosé with that. You're not allowing the juice and the skins to have much time in contact with one another. Um, Chateau Vignolot was created by Georges Brunet, who at the time of creating Chateau Vignolot also owned the third growth in Bordeaux, Chateau La Lagune. Um, he established the estate just north of Aix-en-Provence um, in the 1960s. Because he was kind of based in Bordeaux, he was very much kind of um, thinking of Bordelais varieties. So um, he chose a site that had clay, limestone and gravel over 60 hectares, and he planted Cabernet Sauvignon, as one might expect. Um, he used cuttings taken from his Bordeaux estate. Um, he did have some difficulties fully ripening um, Cabernet in the area that he was in because it's quite high up, so it's relatively cool. But um, he did make high quality wines, and as a result of the wines, um, the region as a whole was approved for the Appellation Controle status, Côte d'Aix-en-Provence. Um, the estate is now owned by Swedish couple um, Bengt and Met Sundström, who fell in love with the place while they were looking for a retirement home. It's not so much for a retirement, but um, they've um, they fully got into it. So they have, they planted since Syrah, Grenache, Salso and Carignan alongside the Cabernet Sauvignon. And in addition to that, Roussin Roll, which is the Provençal name for Vermentino, and also Semillon in a slightly higher part of the vineyard. Um, so this is a blend of Grenache. It's 40% Grenache, 30% Syrah, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 10% Vermentino. So it's a real mixed bag. Um, it's, um, the juice was extract with, uh, extracted with a pneumatic press, which is quite a gentle way of extracting the, um, the juice. Then immediately cooled to 10 degrees, settled for 48 hours, and um, slow fermentation at 17 degrees in stainless steel. And if you taste it, it's got that, it's, I think for those who try it against the sparkling rosé, it's not as overtly kind of um, strawberry-like, but it's just, you can taste there's a little bit more Bit more, a little bit of structure there. Can you kind of feel the kind of Cabernet Sauvignon and the Grenache coming through? Um, and you've got, you've still got that really pretty kind of um, red fruit flavour there as well. Catherine, I know you don't have this one in your glass, do you? But um, no, but I was going to say it's interesting, isn't it? I I always find it interesting with the the Provence wines that, in comparison to the Samour, this is so much more southern in France, but it tastes 
it can taste that much fresher and mm. less concentrated on on the you know the prettiness of the the fruit it's like it has more of that structure and more sometimes a bit of a herbal quality to it and obviously that's with the gentle pressing and the, mm-hmm. the way the yeah. grapes are handled and the grapes that are used in the blend um it's yeah so it's got that kind of it's got a little bit of that strawberry fruit there's this as you call it that little bit of herbal kind of slightly herbaceous kind of character to it as well and then there's kind of what my grandma would call summer pudding so mm. a kind of mixed bag of um of red fruit there as well I always find with um these roses and I quite often pick it up with salsa as well there's a kind of slight hint of um almost kind of peel so it's and then a tiny bit of grapefruit or something yeah, like that. that. Like it's like a little bit of citrus there. Yeah. Yeah, which I think is, that is um, a really interesting point as well, isn't it? Because often we talk about rosés and we often just say red fruit. But there's all manner of fruits that are red, you know, or have yeah. a, a red hue. A red apple doesn't taste like a strawberry, which also doesn't taste <laughs> like a red grapefruit, which also doesn't taste like pomegranate seeds. But they are all red fruits, so it's yeah. It's, we are we are bucketing together quite a few different things, aren't we? Absolutely. Um, when you just refer to red fruits, so for those people who've got the um, the Chateau Vignolo, how's it going down this evening? I'm not sure about the weather in Scotland after hearing that they're drinking, they're eating stew, <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that it's the sun is shining as well. John's got it in Cornwall. So, John, if you've got sunny weather in Cornwall, I am very, very jealous. Um, <laughs> but it's, it sounds like it's going down well, Emma. It's a, well, a nice one to, it's an easy one to drink, unfortunately. <laughs> it is a sunny day. Very unfortunate. No snow yet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad that it's going down well. And, Joe, I'm glad you're enjoying it. But um, I have to say, this is a lot of people are quite frightened of the darker styles of rosé, which is, to be fair, why we did stick on, where I put on the Italian rosé as well. Um, There's a kind of, there's a general, have it in the sun in Huddersfield, wonderful. Um, There's a general feeling that the paler, the better. And I have to say, Provence have done an amazing PR job on this, um, kind of putting out that, if it has, if the rosé has any colour, then it's going to be sweet or it's going to be really alcoholic. Or, And that's not to say that some of the, some of the branded wines are sometimes your kind of your entry level wines. So you kind of, your big brands can be, can be sweet. Um, kind of thinking of your Blossom Hills and things yeah. like that. White they can be now. sweeter styles. But if you're going for a quality rosé, just because it's dark doesn't mean that you should avoid it in spite of what the problem style are yeah. telling you. But this wine as well, in terms of food, would be absolutely perfect with um, just a large plate of um, you know, fruit and misto, so kind of fried, fried fish and... Um, squid and that kind of food would be on anchovies those kind of things would be absolutely wonderful um or goat's cheese as well it does go really well with goat's cheese yes actually alexander's saying the exhibition for vols rosé is also really good this year and it is it's a lovely wine oh dear apart from there's flooding in the hallway so i think you need to just drink more rosé and try and not think about it (laughs) Okay, so if you're happy to, we'll move on to wine number three, um, which is the, this one is a um, maceration. Um, So it's had time, the skins and the juice have had time in contact with one another. Um, So this one is the Sarsuela, um, which is your Italian, and as you can see, much, much darker in colour. Um, it's made by Rocco Passetti, um, who's one of, um, according to Sarah, one of the most dynamic and talented producers that she did, that she works with. Um, he's a great champion of the wines in, um, the wines of the Abruzzo, which is in central Italy. Um, it's a couple of hours away from Rome. 
And for many years, he was the chief winemaker of the Roxanne Cooperative. But more recently, he bought his own wine estate, Vigna Corvino, with 30 hectares. It's just outside Pescara. It's planted between the Apennine, Apennine, Mountain, Apennine Mountains and the Adriatic Sea. And um, yeah, you can see how my little heart is there. Um, and so it's, um, he planted with Montepulciano and the local white grape Pecorino. This is 100% Montepulciano. Um, it was handpicked in mid-October. The grapes were crushed, de-stemmed, and then left to macerate on their skins for 18 hours at very cool temperatures because um, what you don't want is while that maceration is going on, while you're getting the color out of the skins, you don't really want the wine to suddenly start spontaneously fermenting with the natural yeast that are present, you know, all around. So by keeping it really nice and cool, there is much less chance of that happening. Um, so juice was run off and then it was fermented as you would a white wine in stainless steel because they just wanted to keep all that kind of really fresh fruit flavor. Um, I love it. I think it's interesting. Somebody is saying that they used to always just go for, um, for the really light pale pink wines, but actually the darker wines, and if you see that color, it's got a lot more color to it. I mean, Montepulciano can produce quite, in its youth, definitely can produce quite a purple wine. And, um, so the color is much darker on these than it is, say, on that one there, which is much, much paler in comparison. Um, Aaron's noted as well, she says she loves pale rosé, but now finding the darker styles more intriguing. And I think that is, that's a shift that is seeing, you know, he's touched on how um, Provence have done a real big kind of, I say push, whether it's them themselves or just the brands around some of the bigger name wines that we're more familiar with have really pushed that style of wine. But the shift is happening that people are going back to the other types that might be a bit more interesting to them or they don't want to you know hang on to the the overhang ideas of what a darker rosé is we spoke about um white zinfandels and thinking that darker rosés might mean that they're sweeter but also from a quality level you know I don't want to throw everyone's 80s favorite Matthias rosé under the bus here too much because you know it's it works with a very good grape that's mm. an indigenous grape variety that is when it's handled really well it works really well. And actually, you know, a Mateus Rosé on holiday, is it really the worst thing? It's absolutely not. So it's nice to see these darker rosés getting their, getting their time in the light as well. Kevin's mentioned about the darker Spanish Garnacha rosé oh, yeah. as well. So we've, got some, we've got some good dark Italian rosés, some good dark Spanish rosés yeah. as well. And I always find that with the darker Italian and the Spanish rosés, because... I think partly because of the way in which they've been made and also because of where they come from. They just work so well with food as well. So if you're ever wondering, I'm, you know, you're you're making something kind of, oh, and I do a really nice dish, which is um, aubergines, which are kind of char grilled on the barbecue and then you put pomegranate seeds and things on them. Um, but um, that's the kind of wine that you're thinking, gosh, would I go a red wine? I don't think I'd go a white wine, but actually a rosé quite often, if you're unsure, it just, it hits that kind of sweet spot in between the two and just works really well. And so these darker rosés are absolutely perfect if you're ever in doubt. And yes, Claret is um, another classic example of that. I have to say, Matthias Rosé has a place in the um, my family's um, history because without it, my brother and I would never have been born. <laughs> <laughs> it was my mum and dad's favourite wine when they were courting. So um yeah, we're um we're all big fans of Matthias Rose. Yeah. The nostalgia. Yeah. But um I've the bag of grapes a good grape. <laughs> it's nothing. It's yeah, it's kitsch, but there's nothing wrong with it. So no. um, yeah, just just experiment around as many different roses as you can <laughs> they all have their place and it's nice to see as well with the darker ones that they you know yeah Andrew's just mentioned Tavel you, you cannot you cannot avoid dark roses and be like oh they're not they're not quite up to scratch and not think actually Tavel is one of the best roses around I I think 
I, I love, love Tavelle. My only thing with Tavelle sometimes is that you're quite often hitting 14 to 15 percent and I do tend to drink rosé quite quickly um yeah. so yeah it can take your legs out from under you but again amazing with food it means it's a transitional um wine style as well I think you know we don't we're talking about rosé because it's summer and it's lovely and you know what a, what a nice thing to do but it's such a transitional wine for all seasons and you know Karen I'm not quite sure what sort of stew you've got this evening but actually if you were making a stew that was with a lighter meat it was very tomato based and you had a tavel that's a higher alcohol wine and you're having it on an autumn day maybe that's the pairing to go with maybe that's you know the, the wine that works yeah um, and actually the comment about it being Salem Hussein's favourite wine, I had heard that that was the case. And I thought, well, he did have taste. <laughs> but it, funnily enough, it's something that Matthias Rosé kept quite quiet. Yes. So. <laughs> now we've shared it for a while. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Pattaya Rosé as well, but um, Alex, that was mentioned. good. That so was a good rose. from Burgundy, um, obviously Burgundy is a little pricier. Um, for, for across the board for its wines at the moment but again it is one to, to really look out for if you're wanting to try a rosé in a very different style than what you might be very familiar with drinking I mean it's easy to to write off rosé as a, a real quaffing wine but sometimes it it needs to have the attention and uh, treat it as a serious wine as its white and red compatriots you know get the attention of and I think that and then as referring to kind of right at the beginning, it did, quite often Rosé did used to be seen as a bit of an afterthought, but I think increasingly now, um, people are actually seeing it as a quality wine in its own right. It's not, oh, well, they had enough red wine, so therefore they made a Rosé. It's kind of, oh, actually, you know, it has its own place. And I think it's now garnering much more respect with winemakers as well. So, um, yeah, kind of it's I don't think that the um, the influx of um, celebrity roses has done any harm either. Yeah. And I think we we're talking before, you know, why has Provence rosé become so fashionable? And I think perhaps because of Miraval and, um, you know, what was the Gerard de Poggio's one called? I can't remember. There were a few that kind of from around that area that you go, oh, yes, okay. Another celebrity is now making a um, a rosé from Provence. So um, it kind of helps to bring it out. Cements it as a name and then people branch out. And, you know, that's what you want, is it? You want people to drink what they enjoy, but to mm-hmm. maybe be a little exactly. bit exploratory with it as well. Exactly, exactly. Are we happy to move on to the the one you've actually got in your glass? So, well? Yes. No, so, again, don't rush a mic. Huh? Oh, Louis Vuitton have been pushing rosé. Well, it does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know that it's become trendy. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting one, isn't it? This this fourth wine that we've got. In- yeah, so here, sorry, I turn it around. Probably we've got the Domaine Boucrier. Um, the Rosé d'Anjou. And again, this is a rosé that I think a lot of people tend to shy away from because it's off dry. And a lot of people kind of, the moment you say, oh, off dry, people go, oh, it's going to be sweet. Um, and it is sweeter in comparison to the bone dry styles that we've had so far. But there's nothing, there's nothing against it for that. So this is another wine. This is a wine that I kind of quite often say, it just goes really, really well with food. Um, So if you're having anything that's got um, a little bit of spice to it. So I love having it with with dal, actually, um, because there's a a dal that I do with a a moderate amount of chilli. And um, it has kind of um, other different spices in there as well, and a little bit of mint. And it actually goes really, really well with that. Um, So this one's made by Maison Boucrier. They are another winery that we've had quite, quite a long time, kind of a long standing relationship with. They're a successful family owned negociant. They're based in the Loire. 
They were founded in 1885, and they're now run by the fifth generation of Bouvriers. Um, they've got significant um, domain and winery holdings in three major areas. So they are purely Loire, but they have um, Terrain, Anjou, and Muscadet. And they've got full control over their vineyards, um, their production, and um, their grapes. So they are on site from start to finish. This particular rosé comes from their winery, Le Cave d'Angevin, um, and it's located in um, Messem, Messemé, um, which is just southeast of Samoa in the heart of the Anjou vineyards. Um, it's a blend of 80% Grolio, um, 13% Gamay, and then 7%, they call it Diver. So um, there's Pinot d'Ennui, d'Ennui um, Cabernet Franc, I think, you know, it's just, it's very, very vague, that little 7%. Um, it's made by direct pressing. So again, as you see, the color's relatively pale because um, there's not very much more. There's not really any skin contact. It's not had maceration beforehand. Um, mended at very cool temperatures. So 14 to 15 degrees. Um, in order to try and preserve as much of that kind of fresh fruit flavor as you can get. It's off dry, and I did email them, and they did email me back, which I was very grateful. Um, the residual sugar is a roughly kind of, it's pretty much sitting around 12 grams per litre. So it's not high, but it's it's in that kind of off dry range. It's lovely. <laughs> It's a really cheerful rosé, isn't it? Mm. It's so seriously easy to drink. And at 11%, you don't have your legs taken out from under you if you have a couple of glasses, which is actually quite pleasant. Um, as I say, it's got nice... I think somebody in the chat actually said it's got really nice freshness to it. Um, and so I think it said that... So I'm just checking back. Um, there were the biryani. This yeah. evening, which sounds wonderful, actually. I keep wanting to make a biryani and I haven't yet plucked up the courage to do so. <laughs> um, it does have what you're looking for always when you're making a wine is you must have the acidity must balance, especially I think with most wines. Um, there's a Bordelais winemaker who said um, you want the acidity is what gives you that that feeling of wanting to go back and have a little bit more. If you haven't got that acidity and that freshness, it very quickly, it just becomes tiring on the palate. Mm. And so you very quickly just say, Oof, that was nice, but it'd be like having a large glass of chocolate milk or something. You know, that was nice, but I don't really want to have another one. Um, mm. Whereas if it's got nice acidity and it's got good freshness to it, you think, oh, I'll just have a tiny bit more. And then he said, the ideal is getting to the end of the bottle and going, I'll just have one more glass. <laughs> <laughs> Opening another bottle. Um, so this one, it does have that residual sugar to it. And it does have that little tiny bit of sweetness, but in a way that just takes the edges off. And it just means that it's just that much more drinkable. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I would, I'm thinking as to what I would maybe pair it with if it was with a sweeter dish mm. and I'm struggling because unless it's you know lighter just some light chilled fruit you know some strawberries raspberries um that themselves you know have if they're fresh they have their own acidity and yeah. freshness to it in comparison to sort of like a confected style of dessert um but it does have a nice sort of creaminess to it so perhaps something that's you know a pavlova or just something very light, a very light strawberry tart. Um, but also I think perhaps some some cheeses you could go really yeah. nicely with. Like we spoke about the goat's cheese with the um with the Loire. Um sorry, this is also Loire, with the um the Samur. The Samur. Yeah. I think even with with this, with a little bit of sweetness here, you could have something that's got a little bit more of that sort of pecan grassy um, mm, goat and that would go really, really nicely. Especially when, so with the cheese, there's 
I mean, obviously, as we know, that's a whole separate webinar. Um, but with the cheese, it's, it's, it's that that kind of um, that tartness that you get, that um, slight ammonia savouriness yeah. that you can get from around the, um, that's the universal sign for around the edges of the cheese. Um, and so it's it's that that goes really well with that little bit of residual sugar just offsets that kind of slight, what can be slightly ammonia can be slightly kind of savory and it does work really well and also kind of that salt versus sweet and all the rest of it yes yeah so anything a bit salty I think as well so a nice bowl of white bait <laughs> Just, oh, <that'd> be lovely <laughs> um, <hard> as well. <laughs> and you're talking about kind of strawberries there's the um, recipe that you do where you just macerate strawberries in either sparkling wine or a little bit of red wine and what that, that would last a bit it's absolutely <laughs> perfect what you don't want to do is go for anything that's too sweet yeah. because immediately this will come across as oh having it with raspberries that sounds lovely um, anything that kind of you're adding is it still tastes quite natural it still tastes quite fruity yeah. so if you add too much sugar to it you're immediately starting to think oh gosh it's you know it's suddenly become extremely dry and all that it's that the acidity but also the kind of the sugar just gets wiped out yeah absolutely we've had a couple of questions actually and I think um they are distinct enough that we can we'll do them separately so Karen has asked about whether you generally find rosé to be lower in alcohol uh, levels in comparison to I presume sort of white wines and red wines mm. um, she's commented that you know it's good for tax if they are um with particularly with the new duty levels and you may have noticed members that the sparkling wines um with their new duty levels a few of them have have gone down so we've got some interestingly priced things we're no longer in the fives and zeros it's uh I think the similar is like 1176 or something. That's right. Yeah, 1176 a bottle, which <laughs> first time I saw it, I was like, sorry, what? <laughs> um I I think Rosie, it seems to either it seems to fit either way, either with the slightly more the ones with slight kind of residual sugar, like the rose d'Anjou, your levels of alcohol are naturally lower. Um, and I would be, and then you've got the others, like we talked about the Tavelle, um, the Sarasuelo is 13 and a half, the Vignolore is 13. I think it'll be really interesting to see whether winemakers start adjusting, you know, kind of picking slightly earlier because they're picking for rosé anyway, whether they kind of deliberately try and kind of come in under the bracket if, yeah. they, if they were on the margin if you're gonna go you can't suddenly just drop four degrees of alcohol in terms of your style and go hey yeah it's fine yeah absolutely so it is a lot of it is dependent on the style of wine that you are the style of rosé you are wanting to make and then it's just you know an undeniable fact that alcohol levels in general are rising because of the because of climate change because of the the heat and you look at some of the regions where these darker roses these higher alcohol roses are from so you're looking at the south of italy you're looking at you know spain if those heats are rising and then the alcohol content is rising it'd be interesting to see how that is kind of handled and managed um without losing the style because as well you don't want to you don't want to lose the acidity you don't want to lose the freshness I would perhaps be more worried about about that than the the higher alcohol then, in some so ways your balance being thrown out. Of, of you're picking wine. earlier and earlier, and then you've yeah. you still got to make sure that you're picking while well, you've got enough um, phenolic ripeness as well, so yeah. enough ripeness of the skins, because you're still wanting to get some of that colour and that flavour from the skins as well. Yeah. Um, so no, it's really interesting. I mean, I think with less effective yeast and things like that then we will start to see 
I mean, I think we already are starting to see, if you look at the Australian wines that Freddie's bringing in at the moment, a lot of them are, the alcohol is going down slightly. There's certain grape varieties, and unfortunately, a lot of the grape varieties that Rosé is tend to be made with, like Grenache, which naturally do tend towards higher alcohols, as well as you're alluding yeah. to. So, you know, Grenache will quite happily hit 15% for a red wine. For a rosé, because you're picking earlier, so you've not got quite so much natural sugar accumulating, you're still looking at kind of 13, potentially 14%, but it will be fascinating to see what happens, you know, moving forward with the changes in public perception of alcohol, but also changes in duty rates as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it leads that leads quite nicely into um Reed's asked a question as to whether we produce rosé in in Britain and Alexander's helpfully shared the one that we've got at the moment which is the um, the Albon Estate rosé from Sussex which is a delicious rosé if you are looking for um, a a more close to home rosé and we do produce rosé and actually as English wine is changing and and moving away slightly from just being solely focused so much or championing so much the English sparkling wines and we're looking more to still wines Mm. rosé is one where we're doing well um and where we could do more so it Mm. it could be a place where where winemakers really focus on still rosés there's some really lovely white wines around often on the um the sort of the Germanic varieties and things like Bacchus and that, which is very, very fresh. Um, obviously, we're trying to do some red wines with Pinot Noir. And that's a say as well, a lot of the English rosés are Pinot Noir rosés or predominantly Pinot Noir because mm-hmm. it ties in nicely with that, you know, slight raise in temperature for us means that the Pinot is ripening that bit sooner. We, we're getting the ripeness to it and it might not quite reach enough for a red wine although with the past couple of vintages we have seen some really nice red wines but actually it works really nicely for a rosé so I think English rosé is perhaps going to be the next I don't want to say big thing in English wine but the next concentrated focus um, in English wine moving away slightly from from the sparkling wine I mean Emma I don't know if you agree or if you um no I think um I agree. I think you've had a you've had in a way you've had a lot more immersion in the English wine scene because you did the last um, set of English wine walk around tastings and stuff. So you've kind of been a lot more with it. But I, I think that you're right, and I think that it's a really interesting it's an interesting place to be at the moment. It's it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on. And Alexander's saying, any tried any that aren't Pinot. Not um, no, not any that aren't. I've I've tried ones that have got other white grape varieties within the blend, but they also do have a bit of Pinot to make it pink. Um, so say, I've had some that were other Germanic kind of hybrid grape varieties, um, which but it was a little while ago. It was a few years. It was pre-COVID. Um, and so I would, I would have classed them as interesting, but the prices were still at a point where I was like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's kind of 20 pounds or something for, yeah. for a rosé. And I was like, oh, I could have, I could get better elsewhere if I wasn't being patriotic. So um, I'd be interested to go back and have a look now. But mm. no, terribly sorry, Alexander. I think most of them do tend to be Pinot because those are the great Pinot Noir Chardonnay and then things like Seval Blanc and Bacchus. They're the the great varieties that have traditionally been grown. And so they're the ones that have kind of almost, they're maturing now and coming into their own. Um, So, yeah. I know. So I've had um, the the Chapel Down English Rosé has some Pinot Meunier in the blend as well. So as another red variety that is one that we see I've not had a um English rosé that is predominantly Pinot Meunier over Pinot Noir um Mm. that might be an interesting 
That would be good. Because Filo Melio is naturally a little bit more fruity. Yeah. And slightly less earthy. So that would be really, that would be a really interesting one to try. Maybe we should start a little sideline of English rosé making. But It'll yeah, perfect. <laughs> Karen has, um, has, has alluded to one of the, the issues as well with um, English reds and then therefore um, in some way English rosé as well and just English still wines and English mm. wines in general that um, price, but um, the price it can put people off when you can yeah. get other rosés from you know other other regions in the world that are the same quality same style of wines mm. um, but also the yields that we get in this country just or we get in the UK just aren't as much as what are more established. And we don't have some of the kind of natural the infrastructure in place as well so you know kind of places like France and Italy and Spain there's cooperatives, you know, you can share very expensive machinery, um, share the use of, you can share wineries. So we're, we're getting there, but we're, it's still, it's still a very expensive thing to set up. So, um, and I think to an extent that has to be passed on in, the, in terms of the cost of the wines as well. Yeah. And I think somewhere that we are seeing a bit more um, rosé, in English wine is in the the sort of the more natural wine in the pet nat scene that's coming through and is becoming very popular and I want to say trendy but that makes me sound not trendy <laughs> by using that as a descriptor <laughs> um but you know there you're seeing rosé you know you're you're seeing pink wines mm. but they're not rosé in the same vein that we would talk about rosés they're just a yeah. Wine style in their own right so yeah don't want that to get too lumped in with English rosés um English wines they can sit alongside each other and but I mean otherwise in terms of the rest of the world um because I realize we've become quite English focused um there's some beautiful Greek you know Hungarian right there's rosés from all over the world that are all definitely worth exploring it was quite hard to just limit this evening's tasting to four rosés. So I could have quite easily have done a whole 12, um, but I felt that would have been extreme. <laughs> so, you know, at some point you've got to narrow it down. So we tried to narrow it down to four kind of different styles, but it's, um, it's a, a world that's increasingly expanding and there's so many really interesting rosés coming out from, from from across the world, from everywhere. So um, it's really worth just kind of exploring and being open to it as well. Lots of different, you know, this one goes really well with sunshine. This one goes really well with food. And each time you try something, just go, oh, actually, yeah. But this one is um, my next time I do this, I will have this wine. Yeah, the variety is in incredible. And I, I would say so, you know, even just, you just go on our website, go into the rosé section and just have a little scroll through yeah. all the different colours is, uh, you know, one thing that always like strikes me is how if you picture them in your head, you think, oh, yes, they're all pink. But then when you see them next to each other, I don't know if, as if you've had all four wines um, this evening, if you've managed to put them in a different glass, if you can see the difference between them, it's always really intriguing to see and whether your perception of what you're expecting it to be is influenced by the colour or or how it, you know, how it smells more so than others. You think it sounds fruitier or however, however it is, um, or in the bottle shape as well, actually. I think rosé is one of the wines where producers and winemakers have a little bit more playful leeway mm. in the yeah. bottle side, the bottle shape, like the bottle style, um, and their labelling as well. And, you know, you we say about food as well as wine you first enjoy something with your eyes so that's intriguing in itself and I don't know whether it's something that I don't want to say it's done harm to Rosé's perception of being a little bit more frivolous and fun um I, I don't think it's harmed it I think it's helped it I think it's made it feel a nice approachable style of wine and it leads people down their their wine route I think that in 
there wasn't much feeling in anything, but just gives you a little bit of fun and a little bit of frivolity. These are not, I mean, the 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 art of making rosé is very, very serious. But that doesn't take away from the fact that the the fact of drinking rosé is fun. <laughs> so these are not wines that you have to sit there and go, oh gosh, don't speak. I need a couple of minutes to fully appreciate the aromas and the flavours. These are wines that are, they're there for people to get together, have fun, drink rosé and just have a lovely time. Or if you're on your own, just have a lovely glass of rosé and just think, oh, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> and so they're, they're, they are, they're not, they're not wines for you to kind of pontificate over. They're wines for you to just, um, to enjoy. I think that's probably why they've got such a special place in my heart because um, I think that we need more of those kind of wines rather than the wines where you're expected to take them terribly seriously. <laughs> that's not to say you can't take them seriously. <laughs> take my enjoyment very seriously. <laughs> yeah, not to become pretentious. So. <laughs> no. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, if you do, pop them, pop them in the Q and A, or pop them in the chat. Um, while you're thinking of them, I do have a little poll. Um, so if you have had all four or you're just familiar with the four wines that we've, we spoke about today, um, do take a little vote on which one might be your, your favourite. We'll give you a few minutes. <laughs> Emma, you're not allowed to vote because oh. you're your favourite. <laughs> Everyone's getting quite a, f a fair. Is it a good spread? Yeah, it looks like everyone loves rosé, which is which is great. That's perfect. That's <laughs> what we want. Ruth, you're asking, I think white rosé wines from Provence are most popular. I would probably say at the moment they are the most trendy. Um, I think that the whole kind of idea of drinking, you know. So, you know, kind of the beautiful people and um, your yacht moored and um, you're just kind of looking at all the lovely people walking past. It's kind of all wrapped up in that. Um, and Provence wines, just to kind of drop on with all of my friends and kind of just people that you, members that we meet when we're out on tastings, I would say that Provence is definitely up there. Mm. It is the most popular, but hopefully, as we've shown tonight, um, it it does show that um, there are other wines that are definitely worth looking at. But I think for the general population, Provence is still the one that nails it. And I love James. Um, my parents go to the Brisson, but I love sparkling. Yay! You've got a happy well. family because um, I think they're both lovely. <laughs> I have the uh, I have the results here, which I will just share now. Um, but Ooh. interestingly, the Provence Rosé was voted the least, least favourite to, or the least, yeah, the least favourite for this evening, um, which I think is indicative, perhaps, of wine society members against the general, you know, wine yeah. consumer. Because I, I would agree that you know, in the in your supermarkets, the wallet share likely goes to. Um, your oh. Provence rosés but also those are the ones that are really put to the ends of the aisles and you know made a yeah, good I mean, the, the other yeah. ones of course see so your your major brands as well your barefoots and yeah, yeah those kind of things as well um but I do love I would have happily drunk all four tonight yes I completely um I am I can tell you now I am not going to drink all four this evening <laughs> otherwise tomorrow I'm going to be an absolute wreck but um yeah they are they're very drinkable extremely drinkable but um looking at the time and being aware of the fact that it is a work night and um <laughs> there might be some of you who are looking to go on and have your dinner this evening um thank you all so much for joining us this evening about um well on our little foray into rosé we thought it was perfect for this time of year and for many of us the weather has 
absolutely played ball. For those of you who it hasn't, I'm sorry, but hopefully the rose they made up. <laughs> um, Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. Thank and you. Cheers. And um, yes, I wish you all a lovely Friday, an absolutely wonderful weekend, and many, many more hours of happy rosé drinking. <laughs> Absolutely. And hopefully we will see you at another online event soon because we've got yeah. more in the diary. So they are, they're on the website at the moment and there'll be more um, being uploaded uh, in the next few weeks. So we hope to see you. Well, we hope you see us on screen again. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry, Liz, you didn't have a glass, but hopefully next time you will. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.